Ephesians chapter 6, put on the whole armor of God. Uh, part of that armor is a shield of faith. Part of that armor is a helmet of salvation. I, I preached about that before years ago. Uh, you're going to try to stand and withstand against devils in the evil day. And if you're not even saved, you have no chance whatsoever. If you don't have on the helmet of salvation and you're trying to fight. I, you know, I've, Boy, here I'm going off on a chasing a rabbit somewhere. One of the most popular shows on television right now is these shows where these guys chase after ghosts. They go to so-called haunted houses, haunted places, cemeteries, places like that. And uh, they, they try to stir up and look for uh, poltergeist activity, ghost activity, spirit activity, which all of which I believe in. And these people think that they have the ability to converse with these spirits or in some way co convince these spirits to do their bidding for them. And, and I tell you what, if I wasn't saved, there's no way in the world you'd get me to spend the night in a cemetery somewhere. Amen. Now, I wouldn't mind doing it just if God told me to, if I'm saved, just because I know I'm covered. Amen. But how did how you face off against evil spirits and not even be saved? I just don't understand that. These people are playing with fire and they don't know it. Because we wrestle, verse 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. And this is where we started last week, against the rulers of the darkness of this world and against spiritual wickedness in high places. We've already prayed the prayer, so I'm going to move on from here. We, we talked last Sunday and started this about uh, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And uh, in Genesis chapter 1, we noted that God made on the fourth day, on the fourth day, that's because they are spirits. Stars in, I don't care, I don't care what... Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson says, I don't care what Michio Kaku says, I don't care what all these uh, on TV scientists say, the Bible says that stars are angels and that angels are stars and I don't disagree with the Bible. I may not understand the total depth of it, but I believe all of those lights that you see in the sky, that they are what we can see of angelic spirits. That's what the Bible says. Somebody say amen. And I want you to think about it. It makes sense when it says that we wrestle. Let me go back to that verse. That we wrestle against the rulers of the darkness of this world. And what God said in Genesis chapter 1, He said He gave us the moon, the sun, and the stars specifically to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness. And so uh, anything symbolically in the Bible that is over your head rules you. I mean, even in the, in the symbology or the the typology, the symbolism of the human body. The Bible teaches us that we are the body, the church of the living God. We are the body of Christ, but we're not the head of the body. There's only one head, and that head is who? Jesus Christ. Amen. And see, the head is over the body. Amen. A crown, it sits on the head. It rules over them. Christ had a crown put on him called a crown of thorns. That shows that what rules over us, which is sin, and the sting of death was taken to the cross and defeated on the cross. Somebody say amen. So it just makes sense that stars, repre these represent evil spirits. And uh, stars are really not enough light to be able to see adequately at night. Are you hearing me? There are people whose Soul religion is based upon doing what the stars tell them to do. It's called astrology. Astro meaning the stars. They study the movements of the stars and whatever the stars in their movements 
tell them to do, that is exactly what they do. They worship and they pray to and they are guided by tiny lights in the sky that themselves are not enough to guide a person who's walking through the woods or walking through a field at night trying to find his way home and he doesn't have a torch, he doesn't have a flashlight, he doesn't have any kind of light whatsoever and he's trying to make it home and he can't see. Those lights are never strong enough. For us to be able to see our way home, it takes a sun to do that. Somebody say amen to that. Now I mentioned there were creatures that like to come out in the darkness. Owls, lions, serpents. And the Bible mentions a lot about that, so I'm not going to cover that again. I do want you to look, however, at these verses. You might want to turn to them. Acts chapter 26, Colossians chapter 1, First Thess especially 1 Thessalonians 5. I imagine we'll be there for a little bit this morning. But in Acts chapter 26, verse 18. Let's go back and get the context because I see a four or two open their eyes there. And I just bet you there's something in the verse before that that will make that make better sense for us. Acts chapter 26 and verse, uh, oh, look here. Let's go back to uh, verse 15 and we'll know what it is. I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. And we know that Jesus is the one speaking here. And he's speaking the ministry that he has for the Apostle Paul. And he says, uh, but rise and stand upon thy feet. This is verse 16. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Verse 17, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Now notice this, the purpose of what Paul stood for, the purpose of the, the books that he wrote for us in the Bible are this. To deliver us from the people, from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. Verse 18, to open their eyes. Every one of us here in this room today and everybody listening to me from Missouri all the way over to Kenya, when we were lost, we had our eyes closed. The God of this world blinded us. And he said to open their eyes and turn them from darkness to light. That means that we no longer grope at night being illuminated by the tiny amount of light that comes from stars. We now walk in perfect vision because we walk in the day under the sun. Somebody say amen. For, to turn them from darkness to light. And notice now what how he's going to link two things together. From the power of Satan unto God. So let's tie these two things together. Dark being in darkness means that you are under the power of who? Satan. And people, I imagine, I said pray for the people that heard the gospel yesterday. Randy Casey, I hugged his neck after the sermon. I said, Randy, I don't know if anybody can preach the gospel better than you can. I just, I love that man. I, and I just, he was my teacher at one time. And he's preached here for us many times. And he loves this church. He loves me. And uh, I just thank the world of him. But he said to the people that were here yesterday, that even though Cheryl, who was, uh, she had Down syndrome, and some of the words that she said were not re really understandable. Melissa gave her testimony yesterday of what Cheryl called Melissa when we were kids. She called her Bawissa, or something like that. Bwissa? Biesa. And, um, but Randy said she knew enough to know that she needed Jesus in her heart. And she asked Jesus into her heart to save her. Now I'm going to kind of move aside for a little bit and say this. If a young lady with Down syndrome, who I don't know what her IQ was, was smart enough to realize that she had sin in her life. And the only way for it to be gone and to go to heaven was to ask Jesus in her heart. Ask God to forgive her sins. If she, if she was smart enough to know that, what's your excuse? Amen. If you have not asked Jesus into your heart, what's your excuse? And uh, 
But he preached the gospel and he said to all of the people that were there, most of them were family, a lot of big family, a lot of family. It's probably a hundred some odd people here yesterday. And he said, when I get to heaven, and he said, and I don't see all of the people who are sitting here today. He said, I think I'm going to be a little bit upset. Because most of those people have lived their lives in sin. And they think that because they're not following our religion, they think that because they're not giving heed to our warnings and listening to our sermons and, and going to our churches, they think that because of that, that they're living their own life and they're not going to have anybody tell them what to do. But they don't understand that they do not have the will, uh, the free will of their own like they think they have. They are doing everything the devil tells them to do. Here, take a drink of that. Here, take a hit off of this. Hey, go chase after that woman. Hey, go be with that man. Hey, mess your leg. Go steal that. Take this. Lie about that. And everything the devil tells them to do, they do it. Why? Because they're in darkness. And because they're in darkness, they're under the power of Satan. And God sent Paul the Apostle to write down these words and to preach the gospel. And we have those words here before us. And it's now our responsibility to, to not only take heed ourselves, but to give it out to other people to let them know that they are walking in darkness and they are under the power of Satan. And all God wants to do is take them out of the darkness and bring them into the light and bring them unto God. Somebody say amen. That they may receive forgiveness of sins. Notice that it says nothing in here about making you wealthy. That's not the gospel. Gospel is not about how much money you're going to make in this world or how much better you'll have it, how much at ease you're going to have life if you just follow God's principles and, and it's not about how healthy you're going to be and not ever having sickness or disease and being able to speak out all disease out of your body and how you're going to live and you're going to be a billionaire like Kenneth Copeland is and all that junk. It's about having your sins forgiven. And it's about the inheritance. And the inheritance is you get to inherit eternal life in heaven with God for eternity. And among them which are sanctified by faith, that is in me. That's Jesus talking. So to be in darkness is to be under the power of Satan, the Bible says. Colossians 1.13, who hath delivered us, here it is again, from the power of darkness. The power of of darkness. Let me ask you a question. I brought, I brought this up last Sunday a little bit, but I talked about emotional darkness, spiritual darkness. Does darkness have power over us? You better believe it does. In uh, places where they don't get a lot of sunlight, what do they tell people to do? Get under a sun lamp of some kind. We've got some people in this church that have to go and get under a sun lamp every now and then. Just, to, what is that, vitamin D? Vitamin D so you're not dead, right? But darkness has a power. It robs us of our health. It robs us of our sight. It robs us of how we see things and how things really are. When you, are, when you cannot see things, then we start imagining. And when we imagine, we will always imagine things that make us fear. We will imagine things that will be the worst case scenario. When we are brought out of darkness into the light, we see things for how they really are. And we find out, yes, God's just as good as the Bible says He is. Now turn to 1 Thessalonians 5. I'm going to walk in there for a while. 1 Thessalonians 5. This is right after Paul talks about the translation or the rapture or being caught up, the first resurrection. When he said the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. 
Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And then he said, but of the times and of the seasons, brethren, are you have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. Now, we have heard that so many times and we've just decided that, well, I guess that means we're just not to know when the Lord's going to come and we're not going to know anything about it. And he's just going to come like a thief and we're not going to know anything. But that is not what it says. For he, he says, for when they shall say peace and safety, and we don't know who they are and we don't know why they're going to say it. But I absolutely believe that when they say it, we'll know who they are and we'll know why they're saying it and we'll know what's coming after it. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them. I'm telling you, the people that heard the gospel yesterday have no idea what is coming down the roadway in their lives because they are probably proclaiming to themselves right now, oh, I'm good enough, I'm good enough, I'm good enough with God. I don't need no religion. I don't need nobody preacher telling me what to do. I don't need salvation. I don't need that Jesus thing. My good deeds are better than my bad deeds and I'll just go right on into heaven. God's going to take me up there because I, I, I still like my fishing on Sunday. Or we like to go to, we like to go to sales on Sunday. Or we do this on Sunday. Or we do that on Sunday. We do everything in the world except honor the Lord. And they think that everything's going to be okay. They are saying to themselves, peace and safety. And what's going to happen is sudden destruction is going to come upon them. How did Cheryl die? A stroke? Boom. Just like that. And she was saved. When they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, look at that. Ye, brethren, are not in darkness. You know what that means? That means all of those devils all those stars in the sky that wish to control you and cause you to do things and move upon you and coerce you and tempt you and lure you, seduce you. It means that they actually have no power over you. Amen? It means that you don't need to know your horoscope or your Gemini or your Taurus or, oh, well, my Virgo is in the house of Sagittarius. And what that means is I should marry Fred. It doesn't mean that to us. They don't have any power over us. Because when the sun comes out, there ain't no stars. Amen. Amen. Ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. I, I just, I don't know. I know several places in the Bible where I could, listen, Noah knew seven days ahead of time. Noah knew. Elijah knew. Elisha knew. Fifty of the sons of the prophets knew. They all knew. Lot knew. Lot knew. All these people in the Bible just seem like they knew something. They know something's coming. Even Jesus, he tried to tell his disciples, they're going to kill me and in three days I'm going to rise from the dead. It's right over their heads. And sure enough, after it happened, they're going, well, golly, he, did, he tried to tell us that, didn't he? We're not in darkness that that day should overtake us as a thief. You are all children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Somebody say amen. amen. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch. What did he tell us to do? Watch. Watch. Why? Because... It matters to us and it should matter to the people that we love. That if we see the day coming 
We are to exhort one another in the house of God, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is. But, uh, uh, I just said it. I wanted to say endorsing. Anyway, something one another, <laughs> and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What's the word I'm looking for? It starts with an E. No? Huh? Not encompass. In uh, Hebrews. <laughs> That's embarrassing. Anyway, you figure it out, I'll figure it out. Exhort. Exhort. Thank you. Like I said, enforcing one another. <laughs> Even so much we see the day approaching. Listen, we see days getting darker. We ought to get together. Amen. Huddle together and say, he ain't getting none of us as long as we stay together in the fold. Amen. It's when the sheep get out of the fold, that's when it's dangerous. But he said, we are children of the day and not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. That means don't be drunk either with wine or strong drink or drunk with spiritual drunkenness. False doctrine. False Beliefs, false activities, uh, seducing spirits, doctrines of devils, uh, spirit, spirits that cause people to act in ungodly, lascivious ways inside of a church house. That's being drunk. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the, there it is, putting on the breastplate of faith. And love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. Here, Paul connects it. He connects Ephesians 6 with what he's talking about, this deal of uh, the rulers of the darkness of this world and how we are not under that, but they are over this world. They are People are in darkness. They're following darkness. They live lives that are in darkness. It's like I said, when you go into a tavern... You see it well lit. No. When you go into some other places of business, they're not well lit. And now, churches are rebuilding and remodeling their sanctuaries to take the lights out from the congregational area. Why do you think... And I preached this one time at a, at a, a camp meeting about how the, the move is in church building now is to remove the lights from the sanctuary and just have the lights up on the stage. And I had a preacher that I had known for years come up to me and he said, Brother Mike, he said, when you said that, he said, something in me clicked. He said, our youth pastor, he said, he's got the, the youth out in a building to themselves where they have youth church, which you ought not have. Why not? Because if those young people, well, I'll just say it like this. My grandson, Jaden, how old are you? Nine? Ten. He's not going to be nine. You were nine though, right? At some point. If my grandson can sit in here nine years old and understand what his grandpa's preaching, why can't a 14-year-old, 15-year-old, 16-year-old, 17-year-old? And I won't get into this too much, but I'll tell you, there's a lot of youth pastors out there that are nothing but wolves in sheep's clothing. For various reasons. But he said to me, he said, he's got them out in the, in the gym having new service out there, and he said now he's wanting to fix it to where all the lights are off except the lights are on the stage. I said, don't let him do it. I said, believe it or not, there is a link. I believe, in my, I believe it with all my heart. There is a link between walking in physical darkness and walking in spiritual darkness. I think there's a link. 
Let us uh, who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. I like being in the light. And as far as I'm concerned, we're going to leave the lights on here in the church. That way you can open your Bible and read it. Amen. You can read the hymn book. Psalm 107 verse 10, such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. Notice how that puts that together. The shadow of death. And they sit in darkness, being bound in affliction and iron because they rebelled. Notice this. Where does darkness come from? And why do people sit in darkness? They sit in darkness because they rebel against the words of God. They're in rebellion to God's word. They're in rebellion to God's commandments. They are, they, listen, they, they are in rebellion to John 3.16 for crying out loud. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. They're rebellion against that. They don't want that either. They don't want, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. You've got people in this world that wouldn't confess a sin to God. If God was standing in front of them to do it, they wouldn't do it. In fact, we learned that from Revelation chapter 9, that at the sixth uh, trumpet, that a third of the people are killed in this world, and two-thirds of the people refuse to repent to God because of their sins. Proverbs, uh, and they, they rebelled against the words of God and contemned. You know what that word means? They held it in contempt. Uh, I, I watch some of these court channels. A lot of courts now are, are on Zoom and they're using the technology left over from COVID. And it's funny to see how you, you get some Jezebel gal who, whose mouth is in charge of everything in her life. And she gets there in, in a Zoom court and thinks that she has a right to over talk a judge. And I like how the judge says, if you open your mouth, you inject for 30 days for contempt of court. Try me. And they do. They go, blah, 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 blah. The judge says, bailiff, go get them. But they are in contempt of court. That means that to them, the courts are contemptible. And they're saying that the court has no right over them. I'm Listen, I'm here to tell you that God put judges on this earth to judge mankind. Now, I know not all of them are good, but I tell you what, there's a lot that are. And they have the right by the law to make people respect the courtrooms of this country. And I'll say this too. If you wouldn't dress a certain way to go to court, then you ought not dress that way to go to church. Oh, did I say, can I say that? Amen. Amen. If you don't know what I'm talking about, watch Judge Judy. She always, that, that little Jew lady gets after them guys that comes in there with their, with their shorts on and some kind of t-shirt with their belly hanging out and say, did you think you were going to the beach today? Did you bring some other clothes? Tell you what, I want to dismiss your case until you go out and find you some clothes to wear to come to court. Then you can come to court. And I, I'll tell you what, sometimes I wish I could get away with saying that in the house of God with the way some people dress. Now, I'm not that kind of preacher that just, just picks on everybody for every little thing that's going on in their life. But people, this is the house of God. Amen! Preacher, preach it! This is the house of God. And I know I'm not a legalist. I used to be real bad, real bad. I used to be real bad legalist. And I'm not. Or I don't think I am, but... People, this is the house of God. This is not a restaurant. It's not a coffee shop. And this is not Walmart. Oh, thank you, God. This is not Walmart. Whew. I better move on. You contemn the counsel of the Most High. And see, and if you think I'm wrong about wearing proper clothing to the house of God, let me remind you 
that at the marriage feast of the Lamb in Revelation 19, the bride is adorned with the right kind of clothing to wear. It was given to her to be adorned that way. Okay? Proverbs 20, 20, Whoso curseth his father his mother, is his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. You know what's interesting? The Bible says that every man that's in the world has an internal light in them. That's, that's John chapter 1. This is the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. I've shown people before, I don't have it ready to show you this morning, but scientists actually were able to capture the moment when a woman's egg was fertilized and instantly a flash of light lit up the womb where that egg was. I, could, I went, that's John chapter 1. And there is a candle, a light in every human being. Just enough there to show them the way to Jesus Christ. You know what the word nirvana means? Look it up. It means to blow out as a candle. So what happens... And this is actually, God actually uses the candle illustration too. People get, people in this world are going to get to a point where God's going to go. <laughs> and they're not only just going to be in darkness in the world, they're going to enter darkness. The candle has been put out in them and they are not going to get saved. They're not, they're not going to change after that. How would you like for God to go, be done? Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? You'll read every book. You'll watch endless hours of media, either on television or on the internet. You'll listen to speakers, bloggers, podcasters, women on Facebook, men on Facebook. You'll listen to endless hours of communications. But you won't read God's Word. You won't read it. So who is this that darkeneth counsel? by words without knowledge. I'm here to tell you, if you didn't get enlightened from the Word of God, you didn't get enlightened. It is a false light. It's a, it's a light that's actually darkness. Psalm 69, They gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Let their table become a snare before them, and that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened that they see not and make their loins continually to shake. This was a prophecy concerning what Jesus spake on the cross or what happened to Jesus on the cross. They gave me gall for my meat, thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. And so, and what he's saying this, he's saying this to the Jews, to Israel. Let their table become a snare before them. And that which should have been for their welfare, let it become a trap and let their eyes be darkened that they see not. Paul said in the book of Romans, Beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing that blindness in part has happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Right now the Jews walk in a partial darkness, they, which means that they have a part of the light on the Old Testament. They read parts of the Old Testament 
in Hebrew. They believe that that's good enough to get them into heaven. They believe that they're following their rules and their customs and their traditions will get them into heaven. But they are still in darkness because they rejected the Messiah, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. They, they gave him vinegar to drink. They gave him gall for his meat. And they said, crucify him, crucify him. If he be the Son of God, then let him come down from off that cross. And they mocked him, and they they uh, chased, they scourged him, they crucified him, and they walked away from him. And and Jesus said, "Then let them be in darkness." Psalm seventy four: Oh, deliver not the soul of thy turtle dove. A dove is a kind of bird. Well, we know it's a representative of the Holy Spirit. By the way, the, the importance of the word turtle dove is not, it's not a turtle. Okay? I don't find much comfort in turtles. But I think doves are pretty. Amen? I think doves are beautiful. Doves are soft and doves are a type of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus in a dove. And so I think, I think here the emphasis is on something that's dear. To God and dear to us. Oh, deliver not the soul of thy turtle dove unto the multitude of the wicked. If you could pray something today, maybe you could pray, God, please don't turn me over to the sins that my body wants to commit. Don't do it. Have res uh, forget not the congregation of thy poor forever. Have respect unto the covenant, for the dark places of the earth are full of the habitations of cruelty. Oh, let not the oppressed return ashamed. Let the poor and needy praise thy name. I'm going to be done here. Uh, take your Bible, turn to the book of Proverbs, and I'll finish up with this. Unless I see something better. No, we'll stop here. Proverbs 2.11. Discretion shall preserve thee. You know what discretion is? Being discreet. That means weighing a decision out before you make it. Thinking about it before you do it. Discretion shall preserve thee. Understanding shall keep thee to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things, who leave the paths of uprightness to walk, notice this, in the ways of darkness. People are walking right now according to the stars at night. According to those lights that have not enough light to light their way. And everything about them, though they seem to be good people on the outside, on the inside is darkness. And that darkness is the darkness of their sin. We already found out. That God divided the light from day and God called the light, or God divided the light from darkness. God called the light good. God saw the light that it was good. So we know light is associated with good. And darkness is associated with evil. When you are doing evil things, and yet, you're trying to preserve what people think about you at church or what your family thinks or knows about you. Then you will do those evil things in dark places. You'll say them when no one's around. You'll do them when no one is watching or when you think no one is watching. You'll think things in the dark chambers of your mind where no one can know what you're thinking. And while you may appear on the outside 
to like certain people on the inside in the dark chambers of your mind you're cursing them and you're commenting on them and you're judging them and thinking all kinds of horrible thoughts about them those are the ways of darkness that people who walk in darkness walk in those ways God's people should never love darkness more than light. Never. Now I'm not saying that you will never ever, once you get really right with God, you will never ever 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 sin again or do anything against God again because I know better. What I will say to you is that the more you are in the light and the longer you are in the light, the more you will love the light. And though you might find yourself in the valley of the shadow of death and of sin for a brief moment, you will seek to come out of that into the light once again because you don't love the darkness. Somebody say amen. Who rejoice to do evil. That's this world. That's your Antifa crowd. Your sodomite. Your, that, 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 that's your rednecks. Who think they're, they're good Americans and they're good people. But, well, we do little redneck things every now and then. Yeah, we like to drink every now and then. And we do stupid things at parties. And yeah, I've, I've been in the wrong bed before, but I'm a good person. Ah, even rednecks walk in darkness. They rejoice to do evil and delight in the frowardness of the wicked. Wearing Budweiser t-shirts and having their man cave decorated with whiskey advertisements and half-dressed women and God knows what else, whose ways are crooked. You know what that means? Who, what animal walks like this? Yep. Say, even the kids figured this one out. That means they, they walk like a serpent. Their ways are crooked. And they are froward in their paths. That means you can't trust them. That means they could come sit in your church. And they would pretend that they're saved. But they're not. And listen people, we've had that. Several times. I've been here since, what mom, 74? We started coming here. I've been here since 74 and there's no telling how many, how many adults I've seen in this church that were as lost as lost could be walking in darkness. And they're not here anymore. The way of the wicked is as darkness and they know not at what they stumble. They don't even know what they're tripping over. I'm going to ask you to bow your head this morning. I don't know what conclusion... To draw, I don't have some great big words of wisdom to give you to close this out. All I can say is, if you love darkness more than light, something's not right. Something's not right. If you want light, it's as easy as opening up, I, I'd say just open up to the book of Psalms. Start there. That just seems to be right there in the middle of the Bible about the best place to turn to and just start reading. And I promise you before too long, light will come on. By the way, I mentioned during Sunday school that the word wait had to be at least Ten times in the book of Psalms. Uh, somebody sent me a text said it's in there like 24 times. So I was right. But this morning, 
Uh, if you would just simply go to God with whatever God's dealing with your heart about. And if there is some darkness in your life, ask God to help you get in the light. You need it. You really do. You need it. Father, I come before you this morning. I have given all I can give. And Lord, I know for a fact that your words, they have a lot more power and impact than mine. While I stand and struggle of thinking of some brilliant thing to say, I realize that I cannot say anything better than what your word already says. And Father, let it be all that it is in us to want to be in the light and to be children of the light so that that day, the evil day and the day of the Lord when sudden destruction comes upon people, that that day does not happen to us without us knowing, without us being in the light and seeing it coming. And Father, I pray, dear God, that anybody hearing this message who right now in their life is walking in total darkness. They do not know you as Savior. They do not know you as their God, their Lord, their Master. That they would fall upon their face and just simply ask, God, will you forgive me? Will you save me? Because whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. As the thief on the cross simply said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He already knew that Jesus was Lord and he already knew he was going to live past his own death. He believed that Jesus was going to rise from the dead before he ever died. And Father, Lord, that somebody, somebody, Lord, listening to this message somewhere at some time, would fall on their face before you and say, God, save me. I don't know anything about this Bible. I don't know anything about Jesus. I just know I'm in darkness. And I know the devil's got me and I don't want to be that way. And I don't want to die and go to hell. God, if you do anything with the weakness of my flesh this morning and presenting this message, God, if you do anything with it, Lord, would you save somebody? Would you save somebody? Father, I thank you, Lord, for spending your time with us this morning. We love you and we thank you, God, for all that you've done for us and all that you've spoken to us. We praise your name and we praise it in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet, please?